Thank you very much for inviting me. And I want to start by thanking the organizers and the sponsors. First of all, I know from personal experience and seeing what's have been happening this week, how much work it is to organize a conference like this, to find the group leaders, to get the funding, to allow for applications, to get all the applications and choose excellent applicants, and then to put them all into groups. So I think we should start by giving a huge round of applause to the organizers. And all of this would not be possible without um, recognizing the incredible uh, generosity and support of our sponsors. And even though you should always thank the sponsors, in this case, I think it's really great. There's a couple of things to point out. So IP IPAM hosting this conference, thank you very much. IPAM um, hosted the Women in Shape, which was a kind of an AI uh, type of geometry shape modeling conference, which led to the first um, AWM Springer volume, and um, that was a very n nice kind of uh, start of a partnership with IPAM. So it's great to see IPAM continuing to support these conferences. Um, secondly, this was a new facet to research collaboration networks for women because you guys have managed to bring together these interdisciplinary areas, bringing public policy together with mathematicians and scientists, climate science and cybersecurity has created both a really dynamic work environment that's been really fun and a way to learn very fast, but also you managed to generate the support of the Luskin Center to host the conference. So that was a really new thing and a really a great aspect that I think is worth calling out as well. And so um, the, the RAND Corporation um, then played a very <coughs> important and pivotal role in um, kind of helping us to focus on public policy and public policy outcomes. And so this idea of having the rotating um, senior scientists who came into the groups and really helped groups to try to focus on public policy issues was also something new. And really, I can't tell you how very pleased I am about that addition to the, the model and the support of RAND for this conference. So, um, and then finally, last but not least, the AWM Advance Grant being able to support the travel a little bit was, was also really great. So in this case, I thought it was really worth focusing on how the support of the different um, sponsors here really brought this conference together and created something very new for our research collaboration conferences for women. So I'm very grateful for everything you've done. Um, OK, so let me spend the rest of the time talking about um, my topic. So private AI, what do I mean by that? I mean, first of all, it's supposed to be kind of a joke for anyone that does, If you have to s explain a joke, then it's not funny. But for, <laughs> for non-native English speakers, a pri private eye is a detective. And so private AI is supposed to be a little bit of a takeoff on that. But also, um, AI has become a huge focus in high tech and society. And literally the moment, the very day that our executive vice president announced several years ago that we were rebranding our division to be not just Microsoft Research, but Microsoft AI and Research, that the, the day that he announced this, I emailed our corporate vice president and said, OK, we've just renamed our project. Our project was you know, homomorphic encryption and privacy and blah, blah, blah. Now it's called private AI. So everybody knows that what we're working on is relevant to the bigger mission of AI. But of course, underneath, that's just branding. Underneath it, there's a lot more. There's, there's mathematics, and there's a lot of interesting applications that are not necessarily restricted to AI. So that's just to kind of explain the title. Where did it come from? So um, we have. Uh, the thing that I, I realized I didn't want to assume is, is that, of course, everybody, you know, many people have heard of the increasing use of the term AI, artificial intelligence, but um, do we stop to think through how we actually use it and what it is? So when we say AI today, it may mean something different than what pet people meant in the you know, 1960s or the 1920s or when they were thinking about the you know, future of artificial intelligence. And today in high tech, it's primarily used to refer to machine learning algorithms, which are math-based algorithms, that um, can be used to make useful predictions that presumably have value. So the value is, is that the, the algorithm makes some prediction, and then you can use that to make a decision. And that's supposed to 
help um, you know this this decision a recommendation decision or classification is supposed to have value in the sense that it's supposed to somehow improve like your efficiency or your convenience or even your safety those kinds of things that's the, supposed to be the value proposition but there's a little bit of a problem in order to get this prediction you have to input your data and then the, the um, prediction is computed on your data. And so there's a privacy problem because it's a quid pro quo. In order to get that prediction, you're sharing your data. And so that's kind of the underlying you know, trade-off or value proposition you should think about with AI is, is that um, typically these AI services are and will be hosted in the cloud. So the cloud today means there's you know, major companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and other companies that um, have built and run these huge data centers that can uh, afford to run huge cloud services that have a lot of capacity. And so when, now when you say you're giving them your data, that means you're like actually uploading it to the cloud. And so um, in the question is, and now the, the, the devices that you typically collect your data on, be it your cell phone, your, so the sensors in the room, the cameras, these type of things, those are increasingly being referred to as the edge. So you have the cloud and the edge. And so when you have data that's collected here, the question is, if you're going to do computation on that data, <clears throat> where are you going to do that computation? If you have powerful devices on the edge and they can just keep the data locally and they have all the machine learning models that you need to make predictions, then one potential solution is to have all computation being done on the edge, which is not what's done today. But at least that way your data would not be leaving the di device where it was collected on or, or where you input it or where it accessed your files or whatever it was. But today what we're, what we're seeing is, is that a lot of AI services are hosted in the cloud. And so then when you go to take advantage of this, um, these predictions like a service like Cortana, which is Microsoft or Siri or Alexa, um, you'll be um, implicitly making this kind of trade-off where you've given your data and then they've given you the, their, their prediction. So the, we, here we are at an institute for the mathematical sciences. So where's the math here besides the mathematical modeling algorithms that are used in AI and ML? Um, the new mathematical tool here that I would like to talk about today is um, a tool to protect the privacy in, of, and security of your data through encryption. But as you could see from the scenario I just described, you need some type of encryption where if you encrypt the data, that you can still compute on it. So that's the key point, is, is that if you just take like randomized, strong randomized encryption such as uh, block ciphers, like uh, US standardized block ciphers or like AES, the advanced encryption standard, you cannot, you cannot compute on that encrypted data. If you take two pieces of data encrypted under AES and you try to combine them in any meaningful way, you can't do it because there's no mathematical structure to that encryption and it just creates gobbledygook. So you need a new encryption system in order to be able to have encryption that you can compute on in a mathematical way. And that is a very mathematical name, which probably drives people away. It's called homomorphic encryption. And so just to connect a little bit with the um, awesome keynote that we heard from uh, Lucy Jones the other day is, is that from a public policy point of view, you want to be able to bridge those gaps of communication. You want to be able to explain what you're doing and have people understand and talk about it. And this is a typical example where mathematicians and computer scientists use terms that are natural enough to us because homomorphism is a very natural mathematical term, but it doesn't translate very well across boundaries, across fields and across public policy boundaries. So it's, it's just kind of amusing to even just think about our terminology. So um, people, even at work, when they try to refer to our work and then they stumble over the word homomorphic encryption, it's just you know embarrassing and challenging. <laughs> and so we need to also think about um, how we, how we name things. <laughs> um, so here's a picture of how homomorphic encryption can be a solution for providing privacy, which is the, this is kind of the picture of the private AI. This is the most basic scenario. So what it's trying to say is, is that we can outsource computation to the cloud, but still retain privacy of the data. And the way that happens is the data is collected on your local device, be it a laptop, a phone, or whatever. It's encrypted locally with a key that you keep locally. 
and then you send it up to Azure, and the, the cloud does some prediction, it evaluates some machine learning model, does some AI, and then once they've, once they've done that, the output is now still encrypted, so the cloud does not have the secret key, and then the cloud returns the encrypted prediction, and then locally you decrypt it. So that's the idea. That's, that's how we would provide private AI with, with this solution, homomorphic encryption, if we, once we have it. Um, but there are other things that you can think about. I tried to say it's a little bit broader than AI. So one of the things that I've worked a lot in over the last five to 10 years is applications to health and genomic privacy. So you can use this um, building block, homomorphic encryption, as a tool for helping to prevent protect privacy in medical records or genomic data. Um, you could think of a private kind of a health vault where all data, all medical data that's uploaded from labs and doctors is uploaded into your health vault in an encrypted form. And then the cloud operates only on encrypted uh, data in order to give um, either predictions of your likelihood of having a heart attack, your search, searching for various incidents in your record, or giving you averages, or giving you alerts about when your, your blood pressure has been too high for too long, or things like that. So all of those are examples of computation that you might do on an encrypted health record. So it's another application of homomorphic encryption. So um, since this was a workshop about cybersecurity, I added in a cybersecurity scenario as well, which is something that I, we've been thinking about and will be pushing in the future, which is that as we think about proliferating, you know, the term IoT, Internet of Things, is used to refer to the idea that there will be like ubiquitous sensors all over the place, cameras and sensors and things like that, that can help measuring, um, for example, in environmental issues like measuring air quality, uh, uh, UV exposure, you know, all kinds of environmental stuff. So you can think of the value of having some of these sensors. Um, but then there's also the, there are issues uh, of privacy and there's issues of um, security in an attack based on a, like a, some kind of type of a sophisticated cyber attack. So all of that's gonna depend on the way that the sensors are connected to the overall digital infrastructure that's running the city like a, in a smart city environment, for example. And so one thing that you can do to help, to help protect um, data, privacy, and security in this kind of world of the future, and it's always good to build in security from the beginning, not like try to think about it later and retrofit everything with the capability, all these sensors that are out in the wild. Oh no, now we need them all back because we want to enable them to do you know, homomorphic encryption. It's always better to think about these things from the beginning. So this is um, a new kind of scenario where we feel that we could help to preserve privacy and security by um, having sensor data gets encrypted as soon as it's collected at the sensor and then it gets uploaded to the cloud and data is now protected through encryption, but it's still useful. You can still do um, predictive models or make predictions, but these are, remember, these are encrypted predictions. Um, and then the, it's only the data owner that can actually, um, that can actually decrypt the results. And so actually this is, uh, um, in conversations with the U.S. Uh, military and intelligence communities, I've heard that um, these types of uh, technologies could be very valuable, obviously in commercial, commercial settings as well. So that's an avenue to be explored for the future. Okay, so, so far all I've done is I've kind of told you that there is this tool, homomorphic encryption, that has this kind of, peop uh, people often think it's magic. It has this magical property that um, you can encrypt the data, but you can still compute on it. But from a mathematician's point of view, it's not magic. It, all it is is it means it's preserving the structure. So when we have data like real numbers and we, we operate on them, um, the, the issue is, is that if we take those numbers and we kind of encrypt them, like I said, AES would just destroy the structure and you don't have any way to keep um, you know, the, that information. If you encrypt them homomorphically, what that means is you've just preserved the mathematical structure in your map. 
So um, if you've done um, an operation such as addition, um, it would be, if, if you do that on the encrypted data, it's a, it needs to match what you would have done if you were just doing it on the unencrypted data. So all it really means is you're preserving the structure of the data, and that's what that term homomorphic refers to. So um, homomorphic encryption has, let me, I'm going to do like just a little tiny bit of history about homomorphic encryption in the last 10 years. And part of my reason for doing this is, is that, so how many people have already heard of homomorphic encryption? Okay, so a fairly small number, I'd say less than a quarter. And um, of you, how many of you have heard uh, people, even experts tell you that it's completely impractical and you can't do anything with it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So that's what you hear. So let me just try to um, give you, like, fill in your information on this front. Because it's true that in the theoretical computer science community, that that is still the way people think about it. But it's mostly because they don't know about what the people are doing in this much larger interdisciplinary community. So um, the first solution was introduced in around 2009. And not only it was considered very impractical, it was actually not very implementable, uh, nor based on hard problems that were really recognized. Um, but in 2011, a researcher uh, who was actually in my group at that time, Vinod Vaikatanathan, uh, proposed the first solution based on what we call lattice-based problems in cryptography. And um, because we, our, my group also consists of a number of mathematicians, we started working together right away to show how we could use this solution to do practical computations. And so there's been widespread enthusiasm about our results, even ever since that time period, basically going back to 2011, 2012. There have been articles talking about the work that my group has done in this area in, for example, news items in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, AAAS, Science Magazine, American Scientist, Nature, like basically every major science a tech publication that you can think of. So it has been recognized in kind of the wider community that, that a huge amount of pro surprising progress is being made in this area. And um, so even more so, in 2016, um, we published a paper called CryptoNets, which was another kind of big breakthrough. It was published at the top machine learning conference. And it showed that not only could we do a lot of statistical and genomic computations, which people didn't realize that we could do, we could also do actually predictions on neural nets. And so at the end of the talk, I'll have to make sure to leave enough time to show you the demos of doing predictions on, on neural nets. So that neural nets um, predictions on encrypted data. And so again, that, that was a huge kind of breakthrough. People think of neural nets as being extremely complicated, and you use them for image recognition. And so how could you possibly do that on, an encry on encrypted data? Um, so this was kind of the, the brief history. <coughs> and one of, one of the things, because this was a conference focused on public policy, and because also I was really inspired by, by Lucy's talk, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the interdisciplinary community that we've developed over the last 10 years that has allowed us to kind of make this progress. And so um, this is, is not something that just happened in a vacuum, just some mathematicians sitting over here by themselves, you know, working without interacting with, uh, with other communities. Um, so um, specifically, uh, let me tell you about the kind of assets that we, that we have in this space. So um, we developed several prototype research libraries for doing encrypt, um, homomorphic encryption before we developed SEAL. So SEAL is, Microsoft SEAL is the simple encrypted arithmetic library. And um, we started developing it in 2015 based on the libraries we had already developed. But this time we did something different. We had the library built from scratch by a software development engineer, not a mathematician, not another, a scientist of another kind. So John Bernsing just started from scratch, and he built SEAL. And then since then, all the mathematicians on my team, we've been working hard to both 
make it more performant using all the math algorithms that we know without breaking the, the software design and the usability. And so far from what we hear from people that use the library around the world, we haven't managed to screw it up too much yet. <laughs> but it's always a danger. <laughs> um, the more complicated the algorithms um, that you try to implement for optimizations and stuff, the more you decrease the kind of usability of, of the library and the transparency of the, the design. Um, but so another piece of, of what we've done in this time period is to start an effort to standardize this technology because it's a new cryptographic technology and standardization is the process of getting experts across many um, boundaries to agree that something is reasonable or useful. And so that in itself has been a whole huge um, exercise and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end if we have time. Uh, Oh, uh, good question. So roughly speaking, so you could you know, write a piece of code that implements a function, and a library it collects a bunch of functions together and typically has an API, which is kind of a user interface, which allows somebody to come along and use the library to do specific things because they interact with it in a defined way. They give the inputs that are required and the, you know, the functions can be called to perform certain tasks. So li it's a library meaning um, basically like a piece of code, a collection of a number of lines of code you can think of. So um, the, our library is in, in C++ for example. So actually this was funny. This just posted yesterday. Um, this is an article about the Microsoft SEAL library in the credit card industry. And it's basically just taking what we've done and trying to explain it to people in finance. Um, there's been lots of articles um, like this in other verticals. Um, this was one in science from last year, which was um, about protecting genomic privacy through homomorphic encryption. Um, and covered our work and also the work of a uh, group at Stanford who's working in this area. Okay, so one of the problems that I realized after I had already prepared this talk is, is that most of the people in this room are not mathematicians and def may not be working with encryption on a daily basis. And so um, there's kind of two different ways to describe homomorphic encryption that I typically use. And this is one that is very common in computer science to try to explain how, how encryption works. You can think of encryption as being just locking some information in a locked box. That's kind of how you th can think of encryption. But um, I mean, the mathematics of it, that it just means there's some algorithm that was used to turn information that was in the clear, plain text, into information which is encrypted, ciphertext. So it's just a mathematical function. But from the point of view of the functionality, it means you've just locked down that information so that it doesn't mean anything unless you have the key. So that's how you can think of encryption. And so I like to use um, Homer Simpson to try to make this you know, a little more entertaining. And um, Homer Simpson is there only for entertainment value. There's, he doesn't have any real role, sadly. But he's playing the role of a jeweler. And um, the idea of homomorphic encryption, again, going back to this is a different way of describing my first slide where I showed you outsourced computation in terms of a laptop where you upload the data to the cloud in encrypted form. Um, this is a kind of a more common sense way of thinking about it. Homomorphic encryption is like you had some gold, so that's your valuable information, and you locked it in a box, but you still, you wanted the jeweler to do something. You wanted the jeweler to make you a ring or something like that. And uh, Homer Simpson is the jeweler, and you don't trust him. You, f you figure if you give him the whole block of gold, he's gonna shave some off of it and keep some for himself or do something else that you didn't want him to do or whatever. So instead, you're gonna lock this in a box and keep the key for yourself. So the jeweler can work on the gold and create the jewelry that you want, and then they have to give you back the whole box. And then in order to get the jewelry out, you have to unlock the box, and only you have the key. So that's supposed to be the analogy with, um, with homomorphic encryption. And so, um, so I like to do a little bit of a, an experiment here, if you'll um, bear with me. 
So that's one definition of homomorphic encryption. And then we have this kind of what I consider to be a very mathematical definition of homomorphic encryption. Um, and this definition tells you the property that it's supposed to have. It's encryption such that if you take two pieces of data and you compute on them, and you get something either a plus b or a times b, that then that would be the same thing as if you followed this diagram the other way. If you first encrypted and then computed, that should, when you decrypt, it should give you the same answer as if you had first computed and then e encrypted. So it allows you to switch the order of, what your, of your operations. Encrypting and computing can be done in either order, and you still get the same answer. So that's another way of describing um, homomorphic encryption. And in this case, we want it to be um, homomorphic with regard to two operations, not just addition, but also multiplication. So here's my little experiment. So how many people liked the Homer Simpson definition better? <laughs> mm, cl getting close to half. How many people liked the um, commutative diagram definition better? Oh. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so I have asked this question in many different types of audiences, mathematical, computer science, biological, data science, general public, and I've gotten just completely unpredictable answers every time. So there's really no rhyme or reason to, it's not that, it's, it doesn't really seem that like mathematicians like one better and other people like another better. It's just, maybe it's the way I describe it. But <laughs> call the other one homomorphic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I gave this invited talk at Eurocrypt, and someone in the audience tweeted during my talk that I was talking about homomorphic encryption. So, <laughs> is anybody tweeting? <laughs> okay. So um, unfortunately, um, in order to cover the things that I would like to cover, oops, is that my fault? I would like to. Um, oh, good. Um, there's a number of things that I, that I would like to cover, um, but if I start going into the mathematics of homomorphic encryption, um, I won't have time to cover some of the other things. So I think maybe what I'm going to do is just try to go very, very quickly just to give you an idea of what the mathematics are behind it. Um, please ask me more questions later. Actually, that I wanted to talk earlier in the week because I wanted people to have a chance to ask questions, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll make do. Okay, so let me just try to give you um, an idea of the mathematics of homomorphic encryption. So first of all, um, there were a number of different hard problems that were proposed as the basis of creating a homomorphic uh, encryption. Um, small I principal ideal problem, approximate GCD learning with errors, ring learning with errors. So you don't need to know what those are. That just represents computer scientists working really hard over a period of a couple of years to fi figure out and make sense of the initial proposals for homomorphic encryption. And, um, and what they came up with, almost all systems today that um, I can show you a list later of the publicly available homomorphic encryption libraries developed by teams around the world, they're all based on ring learning with errors. And they're actually based on ring learning with errors with a very specific ring, which is a construction coming from number theory, which is why I work on this area. So um, you can kind of like ignore that all the rest is kind of ancient history. And um, I'll tell you what ring learning with errors is in just a minute. So um, for those of you that don't uh, work on cryptography or know about the context, I could give a whole lecture just about um, the kind of uh, history of public key cryptography and the relationship to mathematics. These are all public key systems which are in use today for various commercial purposes based on hardness of factoring, elliptic curves, VA pairing on elliptic curves, that kind of thing. Um, and you can see kind of the dates that they were proposed. RSA goes back to the mid-70s. Elliptic curves go back to the mid-80s. Uh, pairings were introduced later. And these are all vulnerable to quantum attacks. So once we have quantum computers at scale, all of these will have polynomial time algorithms for, for breaking all such systems. Um, now go back about 20 years, so in the mid-90s, um, both in the mathematics and the computer science communities, uh, lattice-based cryptography was proposed. And currently today, for most of our main lattice-based crypto systems, we do not know polynomial time quantum attacks. So lattice-based cryptography is one of the candidates for post-quantum crypto, meaning systems that we're trying to, the US government is currently trying to standardize for the future 
to help protect us in the eventual case that quantum computers are built at scale. And homomorphic encryption, because it's based on these lattice-based problems, is also post-quantum or quantum safe. So that's another advantage of um, switching to homomorphic encryption. Um, so these hard lattice problems that lattice-based cryptography are, are built on are things like, um, they're called approximate shortest vector problem or bounded distance decoding. And the currently the best known classical attacks on these systems take exponential time and they're secure against quantum attacks. And so that's kind of the high level, and let me just try to dig in just kind of one, one more level deep, which is to tell you what this, what this hard lattice problem is, so why we think these systems are secure. So you can think very simply as a, la a lattice is just, you know, in English we often think of a lattice like, think of a lattice topped pie, right? It's just a bunch of um, crisscrossing lines. And the lattice is really like the points where the lines intersect. So here is a little bit of a skewed lattice. You can think of a lattice as just being, in some sense, like a linear subspace of Euclidean space. Um, so I'm only showing two dimensions here because that's what fits nicely on a, on a plane. You can imagine this in three dimensions or imagine it in n dimensions in general. And then all, all of this stuff is just kind of linear algebra where you say a lattice is specified by a basis. So these b1 and b2 are these two vectors. And every other, the, the point here is associated with the vector. And every other point in, on the, in the lattice on the plane is thought of as being a combination of these vectors. So you take some multiple of this and you add it to some multiple of that. And you can also do that in higher dimensions, in n dimensions. So that's how we think of lattices. And so think of a point in a lattice as being um, a, ve you know, a vector, the, they're supposed to be the same thing, the vector represents the point and vice versa. And so the idea is, is that I've just shown you a picture of a lattice that has a good basis. In what sense is this a good basis? It's very short and these guys seem to be kind of fairly obvious building blocks. That is, if I take a point over here, it's very obvious how to get this one from these guys. You have a notion of distance and you go over here, you know, four hops and then you go up here three hops. And so you can clearly see how to decompose any other vector in terms of these vectors. And that's because these guys are short and it's easy to just take multiples of them until you get up close to the guy that you're trying to get to. So that's why it's a good basis. And then here, this is like a slightly worse basis, but now think of a really but really bad basis, like this is infinite, it keeps going. So imagine two vectors whose endpoints are like in China or something. And now I ask you, tell me what combination of them is equal to this guy. So that's the sense in which um, when you have a bad basis, um, decomp like writing other points in terms of that basis is, is hard. And what, um, uh, the, the shortest vector pro problem in, in a given lattice is to find short vectors, to ideally to find a basis, but even to find any short vector. If the basis you've been given is very, very large, then it's hard to find a, you know, a short vector. So this uh, short vector pro shortest vector problem, SVP, um, is studied by um, cryptographers and complexity theorists in computer science. And there's lots of known you know, complexity results about these problems because they've been around for a while. And so that's kind of good for cryptography because we don't want to just, it, it's harder when we make up a new problem, which is what's happening now to some extent with the post-quantum crypto um, competition. When we make up a new problem, then we need more time to think for mathematicians to think about these problems. How hard are they? So this is a problem that's been around for a long time, which is good because we have algorithms that we know very concretely what their running times are, and we can use those to estimate how much time and computing power it takes us to break these systems. And so the encryption that we um, uh, the encryption that we base um, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over some of the, the mathematical details. But the encryption that we used and based on this hard, these hard math problems has to do with, um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just gonna skip all of that stuff. It has to do with the fact that it, it's a very 
common idea in, in encryption, that you could have some kind of a secret and you, you almost always want to do randomized encryption. So if you encrypt the same thing twice, you don't want it to look the same both times. You want it to look different. Because if it looks the same both times, then you can run attacks on kind of deterministic systems. You can um, tell something about whether two things are the encryption of the same thing. So with randomized, in order to achieve randomized encryption, it's a very common idea to think of a, like ha you have a secret and in this case, what you do with this secret is you um, take a kind of a random inner product. So there's a random value that represents a random vector. You take the inner product of these two vectors, uh, the secret vector with the random vector, and then you add some noise. And so that, that is encryption in this, in this case. You add that type of a, a value to a message to blind it. And so it's randomized. It'll be different every time. It depends on your secret. And the way that you can decrypt the message is if you know the secret and you know the random value, you can remove that secret inner product and now you can round away the rounding error, the error. Whereas if you don't know the secret, you're left with this problem. It's, it's essentially that it can be reduced to an approximate shortest vector problem or the bounded distance decoding problem that you have to be able to basically decode to the nearest uh, lattice vector in order to be able to re remove that secret inner product. So that at a high level, I actually find it's easier to explain the encryption without um, notation. Like if I start writing the notation, every person from every different field uses different notation. It's, it's kind of a blocker. So I don't know if I succeeded or not, but I wanted to at least explain the idea of how homomorphic encryption relates to shortest vector problem. So it, who, who thinks that uh, they understood something of the idea based on that? Yay, more, definitely more than half, great. Okay, so I wanna spend um, a few minutes talking about notions that relate a little bit to what have we done, how have we made progress, the, the kind of interdisciplinary community and work that has allowed us to make progress and uh, before, showing, before showing you the demos. Um, so one of the things, and because I think that that relates to science activation and how we can have an interplay between public policy and our, and our work. So um, what, what I, I don't know why, but what I got interested in very quickly after um, starting working on this homomorphic encryption stuff was health privacy. Maybe partly because as a company we were working on health record systems, things like that. But um, maybe because my, um, my corporate vice president at that time was, was interested in, in those things and introduced me to those people, who knows. But so health privacy to me seems to be very fundamental. That we want to, um, if we're going to have data generated about our own health and uploaded to the cloud, I would like that to be protected so that other people cannot access it and use it in ways that I don't want them to. Um, and so, um, for example, like uh, predicting whether you have a heart attack. This was, this was a demo that I actually did at the AAAS meeting in um, 2014. So I did a live demo where I typed my own personal information into my laptop, sent up to the cloud, made a prediction of my probability of having a heart attack um, based on my, my health, these like six health characteristics. And this was a standard public model for predicting. So the model itself wasn't secret. And I got the answer back and decrypted it. And the whole round trip communication, including the computation on the encrypted data, took like 0.2 seconds. And so that in itself was, was very surprising at that time. Yeah, question. So let me make sure I understand correctly. So this homomorphic encryption cannot do comparisons, right? It can do comparisons in the following way, but the, comparis the output of the comparison is also encrypted. Okay. And so that can be, you can continue to compute. It can, you're, if, you know, a branch program, you can, you can evaluate it, but what it does is it um, increases the complexity of your circuit, increases the depth of your circuit in that sense. But still, the comparison as an operation makes sense. So you, you could sort of evaluate an if statement which gives you two results. That's right. Results and, then you keep on. and one way to see that is that you can encode um, comparison as a polynomial. And so it's evaluating a polynomial. But the more comparisons you do, or the more you compute on that comparison, the more you blow up the degree of that polynomial. 
and I haven't really gone into the technical details of what, how that affects our performance, but it does very much affect our performance. And so deep circuits and deep comparisons are very challenging for us to do in a performant way. And so it's not the kind of the best use case for homomorphic encryption. Things like this are computations on real data. And that was one of the ways that we were able to make this surprising um, progress was by changing the way real data is encoded. So instead of encoding and encrypting things bit by bit, which was the standard way of doing things before, most of the innovation, a lot of the innovation in this space has gone into encoding data directly into the, um, the ciphertext, the, the plain text that get converted to ciphertext in a way that preserves the structure so that the encoding is also homomorphic so that you don't need a deep circuit in order to do a single multiplication. The multiplication is represented by simply multiplying the two plain texts that you've encoded the information in. So that was something that it almost kind of falls outside the realm of crypto, but it's very natural from a math point of view, and it's the <coughs> thing that made, that's what made the huge difference in performance in these types of um, applications. Whereas with comparison, you have to go back to representing information bit by bit. And um, there are some innovations that we've made there to improve things, but still, it's a different fundamental challenge. So these are all the different types of kind of genomic and health computations that we've done. And there were kind of two points that I wanted to make. One had to do with in this health space. Um, so I've spent a lot of time going to biological data science conferences over the last five years or so. Um, I'm really impressed by a particular model. Um, actually, it's supposed to be NIH, sorry. These are IDASH uh, competitions sponsored by NIH. NIH has funded. Um, more than f uh, five years now, these secure genome analysis competitions. So the IDASH um, uh, group at UC San Diego and University of Indiana put together these conferences and put out um, challenges for groups to work on. Uh, first year was differential privacy and then homomorphic encryption and other crypto stuff. You can see homomorphic encryption every year up through this past year. And the result of having these international competitions is, is that groups from around the world come together to work on these very well-defined challenges. And they come up with code which they submit and which gets run and compared with each other. And then this, this provides benchmarks so the uh, NIH community can see how well are these tools working. And it also fueled the, develop, the faster development of the different tools by the different teams around the world. And also incented these teams to make these tools public. And so the competition itself, I think, is partly responsible for a huge amount of uh, progress and energy in this area. And that's uh, why I wanted to bring it up, because I think it's an interesting model. I always try to mention it in all my talks. Uh, to think about in science, having these types of competitions to help incent fast progress in areas where you want to get a lot of people to jump in. And so the diff these are the different types of tasks that were done. And I mean, every year there's a really nice group of people. It's a whole community in itself, really, now. And, and then you'll get, you can look up these are published in papers. Like one of these is, paper, is published in Nature Genomics. The results from, one of, I think, the 2015 uh, thing. And you can see what were the running times at that time from IBM, Microsoft, you know, the different teams. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of on and on and on. So it created these, these nice uh, benchmarks. And, um, okay, so I'll kind of skip over where we are in terms of the deployment in the industry um, because I want to make sure to get to the, the demos. And I probably won't have time to come back to the um, standardization. So just let me say that the standardization community is another separate community that we've had to launch in order to get industry to come together to work on uh, creating the parameters and the acceptable standards for this technology. And actually, IDASH and the standardization community have kind of also worked in tandem to help make fast progress. So both communities were important. There's four demos, and so some are designed to be, they're oriented towards the health application. So we have one which has to do with predicting um, mortality from pneumonia. Um, and then two that have to do with um, machine learning algorithms that are currently deployed in ML.net. Um, so these are machine learning algorithms that can be used for like image recognition and um, text analysis, actually. And then the final one has to do with image recognition, just um, 
uh, handwritten digits. And so what these demos um, are supposed to convince you of is that um, uh, this type of um, private service, you know, private AI, is, is very practical in the sense that there are many useful things that we can do today with this technology, such as image recognition even, that we can actually do on encrypted data in the cloud. And so going back to that earlier slide where I showed you data being encrypted on the laptop, sent up to the cloud, en encrypted prediction is computed, encrypted prediction is sent back, um, then uh, at the local level, you use your secret key and you decrypt it and you get the answer. And so, um, so let me just give you an example of um, one of these um, models that you might want to compute. So this is pneumonia risk. So suppose you show up in the hospital and you have pneumonia. What they'll do, there's, um, this is a problem that's been studied and modeled for a long time. There's something like 48 characteristics that are used. If you can see on here, age, gender, um, you know, the things they'll measure there, respiration rate, temperature, all of these different things. There's 48 different characteristics. And in this case, the machine learning models were developed by uh, Ron Gillard Bachrach in my group who um, worked with Rich Caruana to develop generalized additive models to um, predict the risk of pneumonia. And these are actually represented by polynomials, like 48 degree four polynomials. So when you're doing a prediction here, it means you're evaluating these polynomials. And in this case, there's no cross terms, that they're just treated individually. And, um, but they were able to fit, fit the data very well with very, very good accuracy. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take these personal health characteristics, 48 of them. We're going to encrypt them locally. And so I don't know if you could see up at the top, that took 139 milliseconds, so roughly 0.1 seconds to do the encryption. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to do um, the prediction uh, remotely. So what that did was it sent the encrypted data up to the cloud. It did the prediction of your risk of dying from having pneumonia, and it sent it back to us. And that whole thing took one and a half seconds. And I'll show you in a minute that most of that time was the communication cost. Most of it was not even the prediction on the encrypted data. And now what we're going to do is locally we're going to decrypt it. So, um, and it takes 30 milliseconds to decrypt it. So good news, you can go home and have chicken soup and you don't have to stay in the hospital. But um, another aspect of it is, is that we use the mathematical structure to pack many predictions at once. So in that time period, we could actually do 4,000 predictions, not just one prediction, but in the same amount of time. So, and if I were to, to run that same thing where I just did the prediction locally, so this is kind of useless because you don't need encryption if you're doing it locally, but I'm just trying to show you what the communication costs were. So if I go back and I do the same thing, um, the, uh, the prediction just takes 0.1 seconds and then, the, you know, decryption. And, Decryption and encryption were probably just faster because it was the second, second time that I did it. But you can see a big difference, like an order of magnitude, and that just came from the communication. So people's perceptions about homomorphic encryption really need to be adjusted. The time that you wait on your phone for Twitter to come up is much more than the time. It's like 10 times the amount of time it takes you to do reasonable predictions that you would be interested in on homomorphically encrypted data. Um, and so let me just show you a couple of a little bit more complicated um, scenarios which use AI. This uses you know, ML algorithms. So this is um, sentiment analysis. So I realize that tweets are not particularly private. We tweet things and inherently we're not trying to keep them private. But the, this is showing um, because the machine learning, the ML.NET framework has um, you know, twi this as, a, as an example in it. We used it as an example because text analysis is actually a very interesting and important application when we've talked to the military. That's one thing that they're interested in. Um, and text analysis is actually very complicated. So the featureization is done in the clear. It's done in plain text. Featureization, even for... Um, very simple amount of text can be like, you know, hundreds of thousands of features. So it's really inherently very complicated. So, but now what we're going to do is we're going to do sentiment analysis on the data as if these features have now been encrypted. 
So if I tweet uh, feeling happy today, um, we did the encryption. Now we're doing the prediction. Took like around three seconds and then um, do it, decrypt it, it locally. If I change it, and if I just say like, I'm, as you could see, the positive, the sentiment was supposedly positive. Now I'm gonna do it um, with um, being sad. And again, it took around the same amount of time and it realizes that the sentiment is, is negative. Um, and again, if I redid it, I could show you that most of the time was in the communication here. Um, since we want to maybe allow time for some questions, I just want to thank you all for listening and thank the organizers. Thank you.